We're rolling. Welcome to the House Dudes Podcast, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Jack Haas. And I'm Josh Koth. Here at House Dudes, we believe in a couple key principles. Number one, the best way to retain information is by teaching it to others. And number two, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors, we're a community. So let's get into some real estate investing. So we have Chris Miles on the line. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you kind of got an interesting background. So let's just start things off with having you introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'm basically a cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor, right? So uh, anything you've been told to do about save everything, spend nothing, do the same old crappy Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman stuff, um, everything that financial advisors teach, invest in mutual funds, I'm against it, right? Um, I'm all about creating freedom and cash flow today. And, and that's kind of how I did. I mean, I started out being that traditional guy that supported Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey, right? I did that about 18 years ago. Um, started as the traditional financial advisor. So the typical guy would say, hey, you should be diversified. Real estate's not that great because it barely keeps up with inflation. You know, all that kind of stuff, right? right. Um, and then about four years into it, I started to look at the real numbers of financial advising, right? I started to look at it. I realized, you know, like the 30-year average for the S&P is not 10 or 12% like they always claim. Mm -hmm. It's like 7.5%, you know, and that's before fees come out, Right. Right. So when you start to look at it, you're like, wait a minute, if I put in real numbers, put in these kind of numbers, plus real inflation numbers, which are not what the government says they are, right? When you start to factor all that in, it's almost impossible to become financially free doing the same old thing of loading up your 401ks and IRAs, hoping and praying that you're someday going to be financially free. It just doesn't happen. Like any way I ran the numbers, it did not work. And so I was in a conundrum, right? Because you know, with this quandary, I'm like, what am I going to do? Because my pocketbook says I need to keep teaching this crap, <laughs> but my integrity says don't. So what ended up happening is I ended up uh, meeting guys that were millionaires that made fun of the stuff I taught, right? Um, guys just like you. I and mean, the guys are just saying like, oh, come on. Like if this stuff were true, it would have worked already, right? right? You know, high risk creates high returns. Well, how does a higher chance of losing create a higher chance of winning? You know, all this kind of stuff that you know, advisors teach, you know, being diversified, all that kind of crap. Right. And, uh, and so, so eventually I was like, it was March of 06. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I got to get out. So I said, I'll never teach about money again. I will just do mortgages because I figured you can't lie, cheat and steal during mortgages. This was before the, the crisis. So I, I found out you could apparently, <laughs> but you know, I thought mortgages, I could be honest. And then I'll just teach ballroom dancing. Yeah. Cause interesting side note, I was one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers back in the day. So uh, about 30 pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, it, that's one of those things that's always interesting to me. And, and a, a big part of what we talk about is mindset. Mm. Um, you were a traditional financial planner for how many years? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. Up until that, you've, you, you probably were fairly indoctrinated into that mindset. And absolutely. And I, I mean, you, and, to take that career jump because that's not typically an easy career to get into either. I mean, it's very mm -hmm. commission oriented, mm -hmm. uh, pushing for those sales, um, that type of thing. So you really have to believe in what you're <laughs> sell, selling in order to sell it. Yeah. What, I mean, what kind of, other than talking to those people that you talk to, you know, the, the successful entrepreneurs and, and investors, to change your mindset, was there any other triggers and, and how did you, I mean, that was a pretty big mindset shift for you to go through. It was, I mean, obviously like, again, like I was running those numbers, right? And I was like, man, like this isn't working. And I remember not long before I started meeting with guys that were real estate investors, um, like I was meeting with my dad, you know, my dad, you know, he, he grew up, you know, during World War One or <laughs> World War One. he's not that old, World <laughs> War II. <laughs> you know, he grew up during that period of time. So he had that depression mentality, right? He was mm -hmm. the guy that saved everything, um, just was telling, you know, cheap as could be, you know? But he was at the point where he's like, Chris, I need answers. What can I do? And I'm looking at his 401ks and stuff, and he's in his, you know, 60s. And I'm like, honestly, you can't really retire unless you die within five years, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And he was maxing his 401ks, right? But it still it wasn't enough. 
And, um, and he's like, well, what's the answer? What can I do? I'm like, I don't know. You have a paid off house. I'm like, you could cash that out and invest it in something. Well, okay. Well, what would I do that? And I'm like, I have no clue, you know? Um, so I was in a place, I'm like, I, I don't have these solutions. I really don't like the, the little, what I thought was a huge arsenal of tools. It was really the same old tools. It was like, it was like a Mexican restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you go to a Mexican restaurant, um, you know, you say, Hey, I want rice, beans, meat, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, whatever, right? It's the same thing in tacos as in burritos, as in tamales. Like it's all the same crap. You just package it differently. Mm -hmm. And that's like financial advising. It's just Mexican food, like cheap, Mm -hmm. horrible Mexican food that gives you indigestion, right? That's uh, a great analogy. You know, you got, they have a handful of ingredients, but they can fill half a dozen or more pages of menu items. Yeah. It's like sell you, you know, sell you some mutual funds of various sorts, annuities, life insurance. And that's pretty much it. That's all they've got, you know? And, uh, and, and so it kind of put me on a journey. And when the students are ready, the teacher will appear. And one of them happened to be a guy I trained to be a financial advisor. And he had quit that year, earlier that year. Now this is like the end of 2005, right? And uh, we started having this talk. And I was asking him like, well, how do things go? Because he left financial, you know, financial advising to go do real estate investing with his dad. And I'm like, well, good luck. You'll come back crying later and wanting a job back. So we'll see you. You know, that's what I was thinking. I didn't say that. I'm not that mean, but uh, I was thinking, okay, yeah, good luck at your trying your hand at that. Well, four months later, I'm talking to him. He's like, yeah, we've, we've already replaced my dad's income as a professor at the local university. I'm like, bull crap. That's impossible. That's too good to be true, right? All the stuff mm-hmm. that people will say to yeah. me, even on my own show, right? And probably on yours too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like that's just too good to be true. And and we got in this debate about what's better, stocks or real estate. And finally, he just said, "Chris, let me stop you there. What principles are you teaching your clients? Like, what, what, what do you mean by principles? Are you talking about Rule seventy two, compound interest? No, Chris, not even close. All right, second. How many of your clients are financially free, you know, or they don't worry about money? And I started thinking back, I even thought of the ones that are retired, including retired physicians. But I was thinking, no, no, they're still watching CNN freaking out because anyone who watches CNN will freak out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're watching, they're still scared. I'm like, well, none. Well, good job, Chris. Okay, Chris, here's the one that you should be able to answer correctly. How many of you guys as financial advisors are financially free, not off the commissions, but actually off of the investments that you've been recommending? And I thought through the people I've met over the you know, previous four years, I'm like, none. He's like, there's your problem. I'm like, well, give me the answer. He's like, I won't give you the answer. I'm like, dad, give me the freaking answer. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break your kneecaps right now, you know? <laughs> and he's like, all right, I don't think you're really serious, Chris. So he starts doing this whole takeaway, you know, um, yeah. teaching, selling type thing, right? Um, he's like, I don't think you're really serious. But if you are, start listening to this radio show with these, with these real estate guys on here. Um, it was like an AM talk radio back then, right? And, uh, and then he's like, and then go get the book by Robert Kiyosaki called Who Took My Money, which is a lesser known book, but it's actually about why mutual funds suck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got the audio book of it, read it in three hours or listened to it in three hours, right? And, uh, and I went through it and I was like, yeah, I'll admit that's all true. Like I stopped selling mutual funds earlier that year, in fact. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I get it. Like, I understand that. But I was like, well, what's the answer? And, and finally, like I went through the, you know, over the course of a few months, started to understand like what these guys are doing with real estate and things like that, you know, pre-recession and, and it blew my mind what was even possible. And when I started to see like, wait, someone can make 12%, you know, real cash flow, like income, right? Or more a year. Some of them were making more than that, depending on hard money loans and things that they were doing, right? Mm. Um, it was higher interest rates back then anyways. So I was like, holy crap, like this just opened up a whole new world of possibilities and, and even for me, like uh, just some of the things I did, I was actually able to retire later in 2006. And I didn't have, a, I didn't have to have a ton of money. Like, I didn't have a lot of expenses either at that time. Uh, I was in my 20s back then. So, I mean, uh, it, was, it was blew my mind. It was so easy to create financial freedom, especially from a financial advisor brain, right? And, and it took a lot to shift it. It did take three months from that conversation I had with them about, you know, realizing nobody's financially free from the advice I'm giving it took three more months before I finally just said, I got to resign. I got to quit. I can't keep doing this. I can't reconcile this any longer. Hmm. Well, you know, coming from a, a financial background an advisor background, then you even have come up with something that you refer to as the anti financial plan, right? Yeah. What do you mean by that? 
Well, because pretty much I've going sure against the grain of on that. Uh, the financial planning has always been pushed on us from, from for a long time. Like, so what do you mean by that? Well, you know, like, you know, I have my own show. I have the Chris Miles Money Show I do, right? And, and I talk a lot about this a lot. And a lot of things I'll say is, you know, like, one is that it's easier than you think it might be, that there is hope. Because I think a lot of people realize that when they get in that financial advisor brain and financial advisors tell them what their future looks like, it's not very pretty. You know, like, they'll try to give you that, that hopium, right? As I like to call it, right? You kind of, yeah. you kind of smoking on hopium a little bit, you know, hoping that, you know, 40 years you'll be able to retire. But, you know, every, every decade you go, you're like, well, 40 years, it keeps going 40 years, you know, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years always. Right. Um, and so, you know, with, with the anti-financial plan, it's more saying throw out everything you've been taught about mutual funds and everything else, because the only reason that's being the solution presented to you is because that's what, a financial institution is selling you, right? And the financial institutions are the ones that train financial advisors. And even people like Susie Orman that you hear on the radio or on see on TV, they're all essentially sellouts to these companies, these big companies pushing these products on you. And you're trying to fit these square pegs and round holes and they're not doing the job. And I guarantee you the next 10 years plus with baby boomers retiring, you'll hear more and more people say, I guess I wasn't saving enough, but eventually people will wise up and say, no, I saved exactly what they told me to do 30, 40 years ago. It's not working. You know, it didn't work. I saved more and, and they'd want to blame me for it when it was actually their advice that sucked. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so with anti-financial plans, like what I do is I usually get people that are like, you know, people that come that listen to my show are a lot of times like doctors, dentists, um, IT middle managers, whatever, right? Like people mm -hmm. with jobs or businesses and they're saying there's gotta be another way. And that's what I talk about is that there is another way, you know, for example, um, you know, there's, there's notes out there. You can do syndications, you know, where you can pull your money together with other people, whether you're accredited or not. I mean, there's different investment options for either of those, right? Where you have a certain amount of criteria you hit, but still making eight, 10% plus a year. is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. And that's actual cash flow, right? So, I give an example. I had a guy that came to me. He owns an insurance agency, and this is just a few days ago. He, had, you know, he had heard my show. He's like, "All right, what kind of what would this look like for me?" This guy had two and a, about two million dollars sitting in mutual funds. Right now, understand that a financial advisor has been trained to tell you if a good one will say, "Don't pull off if you want to retire. Don't pull out more than two or three percent a year from your mutual funds from your retirement accounts." Well, even at two million bucks, that means he's only pulling off like. 60, you know, maybe 60,000 a year, 40 to 60,000 a year from 2 million. I mean, that sucks. That's like being barely middle class as a multimillionaire, you know? Right. Um, but I, I told him, I was like, listen, you could get that money. Say you put it into even a, a fund or you're buying real estate or in a syndication or whatever it might be. And if it's 10% cash on um, cash return, well, that right there means your 2 million is creating 200,000 a year. And by the way, his goal was 300,000 a year. I was like, with, a, with your situation, what you're doing, and he had some real estate too, but the real estate was like, he had that Dave Ramsey mentality of pay things all down and pay them off, have no profit in real estate, which is a really dangerous game to play. It's like, no, like you, I bet you even with the real estate we have, we could even reposition some things, get better return on equity with what you're doing. We probably could even get you the 300,000 within a few years, mm -hmm. you know, of passive, legitimate income, you know? Um, and that's, that's what an anti-financial plan does. It's like, it's not just based on trying to save up a crap load of money to hopefully live on a fixed income, you know, and, and you're banking on social security. It's really about creating freedom right now, like having that freedom and that cash flow to do what you want and work because you want to, not because you have to. Right. Right. So um, another thing you talked about before we started and it kind of, you're kind of uh, serving me up here now is the mm -hmm. concept of infinite banking. And we, yeah. uh, we've had a few guests on the show, um, but uh, I think you have a slightly different twist on that because some of this infinite banking, it's another one of those concepts. It's, it's a little too good to be true. Uh -huh. and, um, and I'm not sure if uh, some people have been able to explain it quite well enough. Um, <laughs> what, are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on the infinite banking and, and how do you uh, leverage that? It can be awesome if it's designed correctly. Um, the problem is it usually isn't, right? right. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the one thing I might agree with Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman on is when you're buying whole life, if you buy it from the traditional advisor or from the company themselves, which will do it the traditional way, it sucks, 
Like when they say it's horrible, it's kind of true. I mean, yes, it does fulfill your need for a death benefit, but it can be so much more than that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and even guys that say they're infinite bankers, right? Here's the problem is that most of them, that's what their livelihood is. You know, um, they're, ba- they're literally <laughs> no pun intended. They're banking on the fact that they're trying to make money and make a living. And they have this tug of war of, okay, well I can do what's right for the customer, but I, it's also may not be right for that, that client either. So, you know, what's in my self-interest and theirs, and they try to balance it out. And so usually when I have people that say they've done an infinite banking policy, uh, I usually find out that I can design and kick the crap out of it, you know, um, partly because I'm already retired myself, you know, and, and I just don't need it. It's kind of play for me at this point. But what happens is that this infinite bank, if you haven't heard of it before, you know, it's, it's taking whole life insurance, but using it as a tax-free supercharged savings account, right? Um, we're not focused on the death benefit when we're doing it this way. Um, there are people that do that and that's fine, but I, I'm like, Hey, get, let's get the minimal death benefit needed to stuff in as much cash as we can tax free and let it grow. And instead of being this tug of war between do I invest it and you know, buy term, whatever buy term invest the difference, or do I do this life insurance policy? But then that takes money away from my investing. Almost every real estate investor I talk to says, well, this, this, I don't like this because I don't want to take more money away from my real estate investing. Right. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be something that works where you can flow the money through and back out again with minimal cost. And that's one thing you do. Like, like when I design them, a lot of times within five years, you already have the same amount of money that you put into them. Like already by that point, where normally it takes 17 years to break even on your, on the cash you put in, you've already got that much in. In fact, usually it's, you have at least 75 to 80% of the cash from day one that you put into it, you know, and you can access that today to use. And so, so I teach people to say, Hey, let's use this, especially if you're accumulating assets, you want to put money and invest it, right? Um, Say for example, you want to buy a real estate property. And say you're going to get a mortgage on it, you're putting 20% down. Say this is one of your first homes. Um, you know, you can't get a bank loan for 20% on your down payment. you got to use cash out of your own pocket. Now, if you use the cash from your own pocket, what happens is that now you're making money on the real estate property, but that, that 20%, let's just say that it's 20000 bucks on a $100,000 property, right? Mm-hmm. That 20000 bucks is no longer earning interest inside your savings account because it's gone. But with life insurance, the cool thing you do here is you can get your money paying you in two places at the same time. You could have 20000 that you borrow from a life insurance company. They do it like a secured line of credit, almost like a HELOC. But the difference between a HELOC and this is that one, there's no minimum monthly payment. And two, this HELOC actually pays you interest. Mm -hmm. So you can actually be earning interest at the same time while you're borrowing it and you're earning cash flow on the side. And if you take the cash flow and you're flowing it back through like you would, like people that do sweep accounts for, you know, for... HELOCs, right? They use the cash flow for the property to pay down their HELOCs so they can charge it up again to buy another property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you could do the same exact thing with life insurance, but you make way more money doing it that way. Um, In comparison, it would be from any time I've run the numbers, and it depends on age and things like that and health, but for an average like 40-year-old, for example, um, you would have to be earning at least 6% to 7% a year um, in a savings account to match this. If you're doing the whole by term invest the difference comparison, right? And it might even be closer to like 8%, which it just doesn't exist. There's no savings account that pays you usually more than 2% right now. Right. And you have to get taxed on it, you know? This is tax-free. You actually get it protected from lawsuits of creditors. It's protected. But the coolest part is you can borrow from the insurance company with leveraging the cash that's already in there. The cash is still all in there growing compound interest while you're borrowing at simple interest, you know, and then you invest it. The cash flow goes and helps you pay off the loan and you just cycle the money in and out and it seriously becomes a freaking awesome little savings account for you, you know, and that's, and that's how I use it. It doesn't become a competition anymore. It's just a, Hey, I'm going to take the cash I have flow through here, back out, invest it, and then take the cash flow flow back in so I can actually invest faster. Um, I actually did a comparison and I have a, I have a YouTube video on this too, you know, where uh, you bought two properties for about $95,000 down. And I used like real cash flow numbers from those properties. They were turnkey properties. Um, what was cool is that uh, in about nine years, if you would have used a savings account for that money, you would have built it up with the cash flow to about 128000 a year. But using the life insurance, you would have built it up to 178000 a year. So you basically made 50000 bucks for free compared to a savings account. It's, sure. it's awesome. So, you know, and I know we're kind of pressed for a little time here. Um, so mm-hmm. if people wanted to 
you know, you have your podcast. What, what, where do they find that? Yeah, you can go on iTunes or your favorite podcast app or whatever. Um, just look up the, the Chris Miles Money Show. So I know it's a tough, a tough title to remember. Yeah. You know? I'll so definitely took make days sure of marketing. Put, I'll put that as a link in the show notes because I think you have a lot more information to share and, and frankly, a lot of detail that, that you could get into. Where else can they For find sure. you? Um, yeah, they also go to moneyripples.com. Uh, that's M-O-N-E-Y-R-I-P-P-L-E-S.com. And of course, you can put that in show notes too. Yep. Um, good thing on there, like we didn't even talk about that today, but uh, we did before we went on the air. Um, if you're in the position where you're saying, hey, I would like to invest more, but I'm not even sure where to find the cash. There's a free ebook on there called Beyond Rice and Beans, Seven Secrets to Free Up Cash Today. It's kind of my little backhand slap on Dave Ramsey, right? Sure. <laughs> but uh, So Beyond Rice and Beans, Seven Secrets to Free Up Cash Today, that actually shows how myself, you know, where I actually was over a million dollars in debt, was able to dig, my whole, dig a hole out of it and retire. Um, you can see how I did it as well as a lot of my clients. And uh, it, on average, my clients find like 34000 a year just by applying those, those concepts. So easy, easy read. It's like a half hour read. You can read it during a lunch break. It's that short, you know. It sounds like a great opportunity to, for some free information too. So really For appreciate sure. that. I'll make sure to include that in the show notes. And, and I usually end in the last 60 seconds we have together. Was there a question that you wish I would have asked? You know, honestly, you asked so many good ones. I don't think there is. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with some, but the, honestly, the, I think the question you probably should have asked is, you know, how do other people keep doing it, right? Like, how are other ways they can do it? Let me give you one example really quickly, right? Um, sure. I had a guy just yesterday. He didn't have that much cash. He didn't have two million bucks, but he did have some money coming in from inheritance. We were able to pay off some of his loans and invest it. And the cool thing, he only needs 3,200 bucks a month to replace his income. We're actually free between what we freed up on paying off certain loans and what we're investing with it. It'll probably be about 3,175 to 3,200 a month. So we're just about getting him out of the rat race within about a year or two, you know, just from doing that. So it, that's the thing. If there's anything, and I said this before, there is hope and it might be easier than you think it is to actually create real financial freedom where the rubber actually hits the road. So I, I can't imagine a better way to end this episode. So thank you again, Chris. I'll make sure to include those uh, links in the show notes and I hope we can do it again sometime. I would love to. Thank you, Jack. We've put a lot of effort into providing useful content, and if you've found value in the show and have any interest in supporting us with a small donation, head over to patreon.com slash housedudes. And if you have any thoughts or questions, shoot us an email at info at housedudes.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at housedudes. And if you like what you're hearing, head over to iTunes, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It really helps other investors out there find the show. And remember... Massive positive impact requires massive positive action. We'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by housedudes.com. Do you have time to actively manage flipping and rentals yourself? If so, go for it. If you live in a market that won't cash flow or don't have the time to do all the work, are you just out of luck? If there was a way to participate more passively, would that appeal to you? I'm sure you have questions about how the process works and what to do next. If that's the case, fill out the form on housedudes.com slash investors, and we'll reach out to see if you are a good fit for our business. This is First Come, First Serve, and we will have to stop taking applications when our goals are met. See you at housedudes.com slash investors. I don't like to tell a man what to do with his money, but if you ain't investing in property, then you're dumber than a dummy. I'm not dumb. I'm smart. Well, buy property. That's my advice. <laughs>